Today's brief tutorial is brought to you by the Public Health Centers for Excellence and we'll be focusing on using control charts to monitor, control, and improve our public health processes. Today's module will cover what control charts are, when and why you might want to use them, review some brief tips or steps for using them, review patterns that might be observed in the data that a control chart displays, we'll test your knowledge with a quick quiz, and then provide some other examples and resources for further information. What are control charts? Like run charts, control charts help us to monitor our processes over time. They have the same features as a run chart, plus some additional features. Unlike run charts, control charts also have upper and lower control limits that are derived based on a certain number of standard deviations, or practical equivalents, from the mean or average center line of the values. Like the mean, limits are based on initial series of samples. The typical choice is three standard deviations from the mean. This captures 99% of the variation from a normally distributed population. This is what a control chart looks like. Let's review the pieces and parts in greater detail. The x-axis represents your sample, indicated here in observations of 3, 6, 9, 12, and so on. The y-axis depicts some quality characteristic, which could be timeliness or errors, for instance. You can see that the data points appear random. The green line indicates the center, which is typically calculated, again, based on the mean or average of observed data points, and the heavy red dotted lines indicate both the upper and lower control limits, which again are typically calculated based on three standard deviations from the mean. So let's briefly review what a standard deviation is. A standard deviation is represented by the lowercase form of the Greek letter sigma. It is a statistic that tells you how tightly the data points are clustered around the mean for a process that you might be studying. Analysts generally talk about the number of standard deviations from the mean. One standard deviation in either direction of the mean or average in a group accounts for 68% of the data in that group. Two standard deviations account for 95% of it. And three standard deviations account for 99% of the data. Simply, the standard deviation basically tells you how much variation exists in your process. And remember that all processes have a certain amount of variation. Let's review types of variation briefly, though we cover this in more detail in another tutorial. There are two types of variation that we'll discuss, common cause and special cause. Common cause is built into our processes, reflecting a process that is stable with variation that is predictable. To improve common cause variation, you must change the process. In contrast, special cause variation is not an everyday part of our processes and can be shown by a shift in the data points or by a single data point outside of our control limits. To improve special cause variation, you must address the cause alone, you investigate it, versus actually changing the process. So briefly, let's look at what variation looks like in a chart. Your data might have a small range of observed variation, shown here in this very simple graph. Or your data might have a large range of observed variation that would look something like this in your chart. So why would you use a control chart? This is another example of a control chart and it can help you identify and see what type of variation is happening in your process. Again, the control chart has the mean or average center line, has an upper control limit and a lower control limit. Now, most of the data points fall within or between the upper and lower control limits, which is illustrated here with the green circles, highlighting all of the individual data points that fall within these control limits. This represents the variation that is expected, also called common cause variation. 
you can clearly see that there are also some data points, four to be exact, that fall outside either the upper or lower control limits. This is why control charts are so cool. They can prove a data point is outside your control limits and help you decide how to respond. These four individual data points indicate a special cause, as they aren't what you'd expect to see. And what you do about them is, again, you investigate the special cause. So when would you use a control chart? There's many, many different examples for public health practice that we may apply a control chart to. For instance, we might use a control chart to understand expected and unexpected variation in WIC appointment wait times. We can use these charts to monitor immunization clinic visits and plan for surge capacity for seasonality in immunizations. We can use a control chart to monitor requests for vital records or assess food safety violations against total food inspections. And there are many, many other applications, including public health administrative practices, such as timeliness of grant billing, or using a control chart to look at disease prevalence or outbreak data. Here's a simple table to help guide actions based on the types of variation that are identified. As indicated in the middle column, if the cause of variation is common cause, then the action to take is to change the process. Common cause variation represents about 94% of all the variation we see in processes. The responsibility for changing the process would fall to a QI team working on the QI project. In contrast, on the left is special cause variation. If the cause of variation is special, then the action to take is to fix or mitigate the issue detected by the data. It's not a QI project. Special cause variation represents about 6% of all the variation we see in our processes. The responsibility for investigating the special cause would not fall to a QI team because this is not a QI project. It would likely fall to either a manager or a staff. Compared to some other QI tools, control charts might seem a bit daunting to understand and use, but the investment in learning is worth it as they have widespread application in public health. Plus, many of us in public health get to work with epidemiologists who are trained in basic and advanced statistics and can help us develop these control charts. If you don't have access to epidemiology staff to help you, you can look at some of these options on your own. You can follow the public health memory jogger instructions, write and build formulas and templates in Excel. You can buy an Excel data pack add-on. You can also find many excellent examples on the internet, usually for free, that are Excel templates. You can also purchase a statistical software program like Minitab or something other like Stata or SPSS. You can also incorporate control limits into Crystal or SQL re query reports. There are some important considerations with using control charts that you should be cautious of. First, there are two main assumptions underlying control charts, which determines the accuracy of the information they provide. The first is that your data exhibits a normal distribution. In reality, though, this may not be the case. For instance, you may observe non-normal distributions, such as what you might find with data collection problems. The second assumption underlying the use of control charts is that your measurements are independent of each other, which also may not be true. Now both of these, non-normal distribution and dependent measurements, are potential pitfalls of using control charts. Let's test your knowledge now with this brief little quiz. In this example of a control chart, how many incidents of special cause variation are there? If you answered two, you'd be correct. There are two incidents of special cause variation, shown here because the data points fall outside the upper control limit. What action would you take with this information? The answer to that is to investigate the special cause. Here's another example of a control chart. This question is a little bit more challenged to, to answer. Is this process a good candidate for a QI project? And I would answer, not really. It looks to be in control, meaning all the data points are falling within the upper and lower control limits. 
plus the variation around the mean looks to be reasonably tight, meaning most of the data points are close to the mean, indicating a relatively small range of variation in the process. Assuming that this process is meeting your customer specification each and every time, then this might not be the first choice for a QI project. There's typically many different opportunities to work on quality improvement projects in an agency. And you want to focus your time on what might be the biggest improvement for your improvement investment. So this might not be your first choice. In summary, understanding variation is crucial to selecting appropriate work processes for QI projects. Responding correctly to the type of variation and not tampering makes our management and QI efforts much more effective. A control chart is a tool to help you know when and how to act on observed variation in data, as it helps to tell whether what you're seeing is common cause, an unexpected cause, or special cause variation. And again, what we do with these is investigate special cause and consider whether QI is needed for the common cause. For other related topics in this series, you can go to www.phcfe.org and find modules on run charts, understanding variation in process, process capability and stability, and many others. Here are some other excellent resources should you want and desire to get more information on how to use control charts. We look forward to hearing from you if you would like further technical assistance on this or other performance management topics.